Hello, my name is Sam, my pronouns are they, them, and welcome back to my office. The Trans Rights Readathon is officially done at this point. Um, I still be reading trans books year round, but this specific readathon is now complete and oh boy do I have some books to talk about. So I finished six books and then I have one book that I have not finished but I'm gonna talk about it a little bit. With that let's just say that my readathon did not go to plan. Um, I definitely got sick during the readathon um, so I didn't do as much reading as I had hoped and it was super dreary and gross here so that was quite unfortunate um, but that's okay. We made do despite 20 inches of snow and four days of straight up rain and I read some fantastic books. Right now I have two five stars, three four stars, one two and a half star and then one unfinished, unrated. So I would say that's pretty good, that's pretty solid. So we are going to go in order of least favorite and up. So we can save the best for last is how I'm going to say it. And we can also start with my least favorite because it is the one that I don't feel the most confident talking about and it is Tell Me I'm Worthless by Alison Rumfit. I read this as an audiobook and I picked this up not really knowing everything that it was about. Um, I had kind of figured it out a little bit as a Haunting of Hill House vibes um, but trans and like super duper messed up in every capacity. This book I am going to describe it as the Haunting of Hill House-esque horror following three girls post a red room. Let me just say that there are some severe trigger warnings for this book. Like this surpassed um, what I feel like I could handle and I am not even going to say that any of the things that happened in this were like things that I can't read normally. They are things that I can read but they got brought up to a level that I did not feel like I could handle honestly. Let's just get into it. So we are following three girls in this post like three years post their excursion into a abandoned house. We are following Alice, Isla, and Hannah. Um, well we're not really following Hannah but Hannah's just kind of in the background always so we're following Alice and Isla. Alice is a I believe 26 year old trans girl. Um, she's got from the beginning a major scar on her forehead that is shaped as genitalia and she is just like a little bit messed up in the head from trauma. Um, she was originally raised to be like an alt-right kind of person um, and she has kind of been stepping away from that as best she can and there's definitely some issues like some inner issues based on that history um, but she is forever haunted by the things that happened in this red room. Um, you have instances of like stains on the walls like haunting her and like just some crazy stuff. And on the other hand we have Illa who is hardcore like anti-trans and she is a figurehead in the anti-trans movement um, out in England and her whole thing is that she is fighting for anti-trans legislation for women's safety um, because she said she was r-worded by her ex-best friend Alice. Well Alice says that she was r-worded by her ex-best friend Illa. So it's a whole big scenario and that's kind of where the whole scene sets itself. As we go through the story they end up reconnecting out of like hate and anger and Illa is just like we need to go back to the house and like exercise it from ourselves or else we're never going to be free we're never going to get away. So they end up going back to the house. We get a history of the house itself and then we get a history of what happened to the three girls within the house all told by the house as a narrator and then we get to see what happens to them while they're in the house for the second time. 
So this is all sorts of messed up in every capacity. Um, I think that the narration was interesting. I think that the concepts that were being tackled were not unreasonable and I think that they could have been done very well but there was a level of like kink and of violence to the scenario that was really unsettling for me. There was definitely a level of kink that I was not familiar with um like it's something that I knew of but I was not familiar with like logistically um that made me a very uncomfortable the language that was used while in it was very uncomfortable the way that it was happening without consent to like be within that level of kink was uncomfortable like let me just say that I see that the author was headed like I see where she was headed with her story I did not enjoy how she got there and I'm not saying that characters have to be likable for me to enjoy a story, um, but these two characters were just <laughs> like, I just wanted nothing to do with them at all. I should have DNF'd this book. I really should have and I didn't want to because I felt like people were recommending it. Like there should have been something there that like I would maybe like. I was really interested in picking up the horror aspect of this. I really wanted something horror. Um, I think this drew a line of like how far I'm willing to go in horror um, and this definitely drew a line and that line is not usually touched until you get to like a gore aspect of it. Like I won't pick up Eric LaRocca because of his gore aspects to his story. Um, but this wasn't really gory but it made me so internally uncomfortable that I am not interested in this. I won't ever pick up something by Alice Rumfit or Alison Rumfit ever again. I don't. It's not for me. I'm sure that it has a target audience and I'm sure that there are people out there who like it because I see where the author was going but I didn't like how it got from point A to point B. So not for me. Um, do not walk into this story blind. Do not. Like I'm not saying don't read this because it might be something for you, it might be something that you really like. But I'm saying walk into this understanding the severe trigger warnings of homophobia, transphobia, racism, um, sexual assault, gore, violence, the like. And also like generational trauma within the land. Like really be aware of what you're walking into. Do not walk into this one blind. So after that we head into our four stars. Let's start with The Empress of Salt and Fortune by Ni Vao. It is a short Asian high fantasy following a queen and her unlikely friend filled with rage, brilliance, and wisdom. So this was only like a two and a half hour audiobook. It was really good and it was about this empress who she she's from the north and her family like sold her down to this other kingdom for a political marriage um she gets married has a child and then is exiled um and is no longer allowed to have any more children so there is no prince there is no like argument of like who's the prince in this scenario it's just the one the one prince that she had and she is not really welcomed in this kingdom in the first place so she makes friends with a handmaiden that we refer to as Rabbit. They are someone who got sold into the kingdom because their village did not have enough of a specific item to send down to the, their emperor so they basically were like you're gonna go with less of what we owe and they're the emperor's just like gonna give you mercy and like take you as part of the payment and that's pretty much exactly what happened. Once the Empress gets exiled and her hair made in with her she starts kind of plotting and causing a little bit of chaos throughout the world itself and that's kind of as much as I want to tell you. It was really interesting. It was told in a really interesting manner. I enjoyed the narration so much and I really liked the level at which they took the story for the amount of time it had. I think that it takes a really strong author 
to understand when a story should start and when it should end and to not make it too big. This one was perfectly sized, honestly. I know that a lot of authors would have taken it quite a few steps further and I respect this author so much for keeping it condensed because it was really good. I believe it was this author's debut too. Um, it was really interesting. It was really good. It was an Asian fantasy and I think that if you are someone who is just getting into like that level of Asian fantasies um, and you're not really sure where to start with it, I think that this is a really good option because it's short and it'll kind of get you into some of the language. So I think this is a really good option for starting. Other than that, let's go to Making Love with the Land by Joshua Whitehead. This is a bunch of nonfiction essays about life as a two-spirit, fat, queer, indigenous writer. They are such an incredible author. I picked this up specifically because there was an anthology that I read that was edited by Joshua Whitehead that is the only anthology that I have ever given five stars to. It is so good. So I was like, let me pick up some of their writing. I wasn't really ready to get into Johnny Appleseed. I was a little bit nervous. So I was like, let's pick up this. And I've talked about it a little bit throughout the vlog, but this is only getting a four star because I listened to the audiobook. And I think that there are definitely some things that I missed by listening to the audiobook that I am interested in remedying. So I would like to grab the physical book of this to be able to pick it up, to pick up those little aspects that I missed out in my audiobook listening. Because some of the words that are used throughout this knowledge are, I believe, indigenous. Um, so I definitely, like, that was lost on me. I don't know those words and I didn't have the time to like stop and try to figure out how to spell it and try to look it up and do all of that. That is something that I need a physical book for and I am going to be on the hunt for it now. I really really enjoyed this. I think that once I read it physically I will be able to bump this up to a five star because I think that there is a level of understanding that I lost because of it. But their writing is just stunning. It is just gorgeous. The way they talk about family, writing, their identity as like a queer fat person, their identity as a two-spirit person, their relationships with their partner, ex-partner, more than anything really resonated with me quite a bit. It's like how can such an important relationship to you just kind of die off just because you're not together in the exact way that you originally were I think was really interesting. I think that the way that they spoke about adjusting to a touchless life post-pandemic, not not post-pandemic but you know what I mean when I say that because the pandemic's not over but the ways that touch has changed since we have started the pandemic um, and how we have adjusted from such a deep physical life filled with small touches and hugs and little things like that into something that is incredibly separate even in our close communities. It's such a hard thing to be okay with um, and this is not, I don't believe this is them advocating for like lax COVID protections and this is not me doing the same thing like <laughs> let's be honest here don't touch me. I don't like being touched. Um, but I just think that it's an interesting conversation to have, especially for people who are really touch focused in their lives. And I thought that was an interesting conversation for me to like watch as someone who sometimes when people will touch me, especially in my close family, I'll just kind of start screaming and fall to the ground to get them to stop touching me. So it was an interesting conversation to lay witness to. I really enjoyed this. I think that it was really amazing and I'm going to pick up Johnny Appleseed fairly soon now. And my last four star book was The Sacrifice by Rin Chapeco, which I read. It was the first book that I finished in the Trans Rights Readathon. It was an audiobook and it is a Vietnamese haunted island being desecrated by Hollywood and it getting its revenge. It was 
so good. It was so good. I really, really enjoyed it. I forgot how much I enjoyed Rin Gepecco as a writer because they wrote The Bone Witch, um, which I read many, many years ago and I really, really liked and I've been wanting to get back to it to continue the series for years now, but I just haven't gotten to it. Um, but we follow a kid who lives on this island who has been taking care of their sick father for many a years and this Hollywood crew comes onto the island and they're just like we need to film a documentary this is like a haunted island um there were some cult killings here a plane crash here blah 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 blah, blah. death destruction sacrifices whatever 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 um and the kid is like you know y'all should leave and they're like, so you're not going to be our guide? And the kid's like, no, I'll be your guide. But if you don't leave, like, there's going to be a lot of death going on. And of course, Hollywood decides to stay because they don't care about sacred lands. They don't care about anything other than money. And you can imagine how it goes from there. It was a really interesting story. I loved every second of it honestly. I loved the main character and I loved the kind of love interest to it. I enjoyed the parental aspect in both our main character and the love interest. I think that was a fantastic aspect of it. I thought it was creepy. I thought it was haunting but I thought that it was all well deserved. You know what I say? There's definitely some gore there. There's definitely like men being haunted by their pasts because they're bad people. There's definitely mentions of death, essay, abuse, all of that. So there's definitely some trigger warnings to be had, but I wouldn't say anything super severe. I, I would say a lot of it is just like mentioning of these topics. So it was really good. It was really interesting. This has definitely like sparked a love for Rin Shepeko back up again and I would definitely be interested in grabbing a copy of this to add to my collection. Now <laughs> let's talk about my two physical reads that I got through that both ended up being five stars for me. So we are starting with Pet by Kweke Mezi. This is about Jam A trans girl who conjures a being out of a painting with her blood. This being comes out to hunt in her best friend's family. So there's a whole lot that comes with this. This is technically the first book and Bitter is technically the prequel but I read Bitter first by accident not really realizing. So I definitely had a better understanding of some of the concepts in here that I think that a lot of people did when they first read this but I loved it nonetheless. So we've got Jam and this creature that we call Pet and Pet is like we need to hunt for monsters. There is a monster in the house of Rede redemption her best friend. So they kind of go on this quest to uncover the monster to uncover what monsters really entail at this point um, because they live in Lucille which is like a reformed community and all of the adults are like there are no monsters. But what are you talking about? There are no monsters. I just think that this was really fantastic. I think that it brought up like learning about the abuse that makes people monsters again I think was really hard. I think there was a specific scene between Redemption and his parents not believing him when he found out who the monster was and what the monster was doing to his little brother um, was definitely like a trigger moment for me. It was really really difficult to read because the reality is like people don't want to accept it but the reality is that a lot of times adults are like no you're lying for attention because they just can't believe that another adult would do that. Um, but the reality is that like other adults definitely do that. A lot. <laughs> so this one was easy to read but hard to read and it was also incredibly validating and it honestly like kind of felt like putting a warm safe blanket over me. It was it was just everything. Okweke Amezi is a beautiful writer. They write the most beautiful stories and I will definitely, this is a library copy, but I will definitely have to grab myself my own copy of this to go along with Bitter. If you have not picked up this YA duology, pick it up. 
you will not regret it. It is beautiful in every capacity. Let's talk about the last book that I read for the Trans Rights Readathon that was five stars. This one was definitely 100% my favorite out of all the books that I read and it is The Spirit Bears Its Teeth by Andrew Joseph White. This book was stunning. It is a trans Victorian psychic high stakes murder mystery and when I say high stakes I mean life or death. It was everything. Um, let me talk about trigger warnings real quick because also mad respect to Andrew Joseph White, one of my favorite authors. He includes trigger warnings in his author letter. So, The Spirit Bears Its Teeth contains transphobia, ableism, graphic violence, sexual assault, discussion of forced pregnancy and miscarriage, mentions of suicidal ideation, and extensive medical gore. What could be better than an author who is so self-aware that they include trigger warnings right there for you on the page. I think that should be the standard at this point. I highly think that that should be the standard and anyone who disagrees I'm sorry I think you're wrong. This is one of my hot takes that like no one can argue with me against. There is nothing wrong that can come from putting your trigger warnings in the pages of your book. There's nothing wrong with it. You should not force people to go looking on reader apps looking for trigger warnings. It's not right because sometimes the trigger warnings aren't correct on apps like Storygraph or Goodreads. Sometimes people don't emphasize something. Sometimes people have a really severe trigger warning for something that other people can tolerate quite easily. So something that someone might say is minor would be fairly extreme. For your reader. So I think that everyone should be putting trigger warnings in the front pages of their books. Again if you disagree with me you're wrong. <laughs> you're you're wrong. Um, with that now that we've taken out my my one my one and only reader hot take um, that Andrew Joseph White has brought out because he is such a wonderful human being. Um, so we are following 16 year old Silas in this. He is a trans boy and he decides that he is not willing to live the life of a Victorian woman with purple eyes um, because the Victorian women with purple eyes are basically just sold off to be baby makers um, to create boys with purple eyes so they can be psychics and they can see through the veil but women aren't allowed to see through the veil ever even though they have purple eyes. Um, he's like no I'm not gonna be living that life I'm getting out of this. I'm, I'm living my my true self. So he tries to invade a ceremony to get a hand a like scar on his hand that shows that he's like a psychic and that would give him a lot of power to get around places and escape the life that his parents are trying to push onto him. Well, that goes horribly wrong. It goes horribly, horribly wrong. So instead, his betrothed fiance, whatever, his fiance's father that his parents sold him to, um, is just like, we value you a lot. Um, we want, I still want you to marry my son, so we're gonna send you to this reform reformatory school to get rid of your veil sickness. Any reformatory school is basically a death sentence. So they send him off to overcome his veil sickness and he is surrounded by I believe like eight or so other girl like eight or so girls um, and slowly some things start to happen and some of the girls start to disappear. So he takes it on in his, as his mission to one, try and get out, two, figure out what is happening to these girls, and three, he starts to fall in love with his fiance who is a trans girl herself. So horror, murder mystery, the highest stakes of murder mysteries. If he didn't figure it out he was dying himself. So this was everything. I loved every single second of this. I think that this was such a beautiful story. I think that this had the most beautiful aspect of tea for tea for me. Um, it, it was just, it was everything. It was everything. If you pick up one book 
out of what I have read, pick up The Spirit Bears Its Teeth by Andrew Joseph White. As long as you like horror. As long as you like horror. Don't pick this up as a beginner in horror. This is, I would, this is YA, but this is not for beginners. This is gory. He wants to be a surgeon, so he's talking about like peeling people's skin open and being all up in their organs. Like, it's uh, brutal. This was brutal, but it was so good. I loved every second of it. It was so good. Okay, now that we have talked about all of the books that I have finished, we can talk about the one that I am still in the middle of and I am going to try to read it and get through it because I really enjoyed it. I just didn't get to it. It is an ebook and it is Yours Insatiably by Avita Vice. It is an office, a monster office romance between a fae and a succubus. Um, I'm only like 30% of the way through right now, so I don't have a lot of details to give to you right now, but ooh, ooh, is it, is it sassy? It is. I, I never knew that eyeballs and smirks could be so sassy. It's so good. Um, and this is also an autistic romance too, which I am loving. So I am super interested in it. I want to continue with it. So yeah, I'm going to but I don't have anything else to tell you at this point. So I've been rambling on like no other to tell you about all of the books that I read. I definitely didn't get through all of them. I did not get through The Meet Cute Diary by Emery Lee or Dreadnought or The Queen of the Conquered by Casey Callender, which I've been trying to get through for months. I don't know why I keep not getting to it, but it's my own fault. It's truly my own fault, but I did get through a lot. And I'm super happy with where I popped out. We all knew that my 11 book TBR was completely unrealistic in every capacity. To say through that I got through six and a half is a success in my eyes. With that, I hope that everyone else had the most wonderful Trans Rights Readathon and you're feeling happy and affirmed in everything that you read. This is actually going to count as my March wrap up. I don't really feel the need to talk about the other books that I read in March. Um, I'm not really interested in talking about the other books that I read in March outside of the Trans Rates Readathon because I didn't think that they were very good. Um, I could throw out some titles real quick just in case anyone's interested. It was Providence Girls by Borgen Dante, which I really loved, four stars. Craven Manor by Darcy Coates, three and a half stars. The Absence Underground by Jamie Pacton, two stars. The Hacienda by Isabel Cañas, two and a half stars. The Woods All Black by Lee Mandelo, five stars. There's a review for that on my page if you would like to consume that. Um, Ghost Eaters by Clay McLeod Capman, Ugh. one and a half stars. So there's the rest of my March wrap up, but really this was for the Trans Rights Readathon. So I will see y'all next time for an April TBR and we can kind of go from there. I hope that everyone is having the most fantastic day and I will see y'all next time. Bye.